Welcome, everyone, to What the Force, and welcome to a new episode and a discussion all about sort of the ooh, mythological and Campbellian influences that we see within the saga that is now almost completed. And with me today is joining for the discussion, we have Natasha Fox. Hello. <laughs> and Lindsay Romain, staff writer at Nerdist. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. This is great. And both of you actually have been discussing this online. So Nat, you originally did like this massive Twitter thread <laughs> all about the goddess as you were reading it and finishing it that up. And Lindsay, you actually did some articles, the central motivation and all of that focused on the goddess's book uh, by Joseph Campbell. Nat's thread was very helpful in that. So uh, I'm very excited to be here, able to join you guys. <laughs> That's great. Nat, do you want to take us back to to when you were reading this book? And I've recently picked it up based on not only your suggestion, Nat, but like uh, high level, like reading all about it back in December when I was recording for the podcast previously, just to talk about uh, Maureen Murdoch's take on the heroine's journey. So it's very similar in that aspect. But Nat, uh, I think you were, was it, were you coming back from Celebration when you were reading it? <laughs> yeah, I was literally reading on the plane on the way back from Celebration and texting you on it. And for some context in regards to my exposure to this book and to some of the history behind it, since The Last Jedi, I've been really delving into 90s psychology and the movements around that in regards to not only feminist, like the goddess feminism of the 90s, but also in terms of the way that Ryan Johnson referenced Robert Bly and James Hillman and all mm -hmm. of these people that were part of that movement at that time. So I had actually ignored Goddesses because it wasn't actually written as much by Joseph Campbell as his collection of his lectures and his writings from the end of his life when he started to get into that topic finally. And when I opened the book and um, even just on my e-reader and saw some of the original pictures and you know art around it and just my brain just lit up like a Christmas tree. It was great, but I didn't really think that there was any real value in it, I guess. I thought it was a little cracky to be like, okay, well, you know, the art from Knossos or from the Minoan culture is <laughs> could be relevant to this, but then I just kept reading and I think I just, yeah, I kept going down that rabbit hole. Yep, <laughs> definitely. Well, I mean, and what kind of triggered like me as far as seeing the connections was definitely the tie to, you know, the bull mythos with the Minoans and the Rise of Skywalker trailer, which you drew the parallel to. Yeah, I've taken one art history class in my entire life because I was a STEM <laughs> major, so I'm not <laughs> qualified to talk about it. But I do remember sitting in that art history class and being so fascinated by the idea, idea that there are feminine figures in that art. So women are depicted in that bull, bull leaping or bull jumping and we'll get into kind of the details of that around the history and the unpacking mm -hmm. of that. But um, I've always kind of associated it with more of like this kind of proto-feminist archetype. So it was great to see it in the book and then to sort of start going into that in terms of is there a possible thread of influence here in regards to the sequel trilogy? And I mean, I may wear a tinfoil hat every day of my life, but I will don my tinfoil armor for this theory. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like at least on this show... When we get a little bit into it, it's like a tinfoil tiara or a crown, like, because, you know, we're ladies, right? Like, we got to do that. Um, and I believe that uh, you have you have a history as well, Lindsay, with this book. Yeah, well, actually, um, I hadn't read it since college, I don't think. I was an English lit major um, many years ago now at this point. And um I think I read, I took in like an intro to mythology course where we did a lot of Campbell stuff, obviously. And I do remember like having familiarity with it, but I hadn't even opened it in years and years, but I do own it. Um, and it was kind of the same thing. It was actually in that thread when you posted the, the bull jumping thing. And I was like, oh yeah, right. And I went back and opened the book and it is honestly flipping through it and just seeing some of the, you know, like you were talking about the figurines and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, Ryan Johnson has definitely read this book. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> totally. 
Yeah, and it is sort of just like, again, like you said, it lit your your brain up like a Christmas tree. It sort of did the same thing for me. And I went back and just started highlighting passages and stuff. And I was like, I don't know if any of this is actually leading to anything or if it is just my tinfoil tiara acting up. But I definitely, there's so many things just nestled in this book that feel like they could be super relevant. I mean, especially to The Last Jedi, but going forward also. And what I want to say is like, and I've I've drawn this conclusion in previous podcasts, so I'm just going to like reiterate it very high level is that it feels like the problem in the Skywalker saga is the missing feminine. Like when we talk about, you know, the fact that Anakin Skywalker misses his mother, the fact that he's always obsessed with Padme and then eventually like kills her and then she's gone from the saga from that point forward and it's like the Skywalker saga now is trying to figure out the missing mother of the story you know or the or the feminine within it and this very much ties to culturally in the last 40 50 years what we've been going through especially with the feminist movement to understand you know, what is the feminine place in society? Is it kind of what we've always assumed? Or is it something more? And that, like, especially with your interest with um, feminist psychology, that very much ties into that. Yeah, the 90s were a really weird time for feminism. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, Coming out of second wave feminism. And, you know, the goddess feminism started in the 70s, pretty much, and was kind of reached its peak at that time period. So I grew up reading like Clarissa Pinkola Estes and A Woman Who Run With the Wolves and Yolen and Starhawk and all like sort of these figures of Jungian mythopoetic women's feminism. And mm-hmm. you know, they have faults to them in regards to the lens is very limited. It's almost appropriative in some ways. But there is like this general understanding that women's folklore, women's mythology has always been around but how we've been talking about it, how we've been considering it as the basis for our stories and our feminine narratives. And when I was exposed to The Force Awakens, when I first watched that movie, I was blown away by the idea that Maureen Murdoch's heroine's journey was actually prevalent within the film. And Mm -hmm. then that kind of just kept going in the sense that me and quite a few other women were able to say, okay, this is the next step in the journey. This is what's going to happen. We're going to confront the powerless father. We're going to have this understanding and confrontation with you know, the missing feminine, and it actually yep. resolved itself within the movie. So she goes into the cave, she has discussion, you know, with the goddess, all of those things are actually very present in The Last Jedi, which is really, really exciting to see. And like drawing those parallels to the heroine's journey, which is Maureen Murdoch and Joseph Campbell will agree that like the steps are very similar in the hero's and heroine's journey, but that they end up, you know, having just more of this internal Uh, feel to it. And that's, you know, sometimes what people are more critical about um, sequel trilogy is that Ray's journey is very internalized. What she's experiencing is very personal. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, even The Last Jedi sort of feels like Octu is just like this representation of a lot of that feminine energy, which I'm sure we'll get into, but just the, the imagery of it and whatnot, the place where she begins her story in that film feels so centered on that sort of goddesses you know, lineage, really. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just like high level, what do you see, Lindsay? Well, I think, you know, the symbol of the frog is something that's very tied to that, uh, the, you know, the frog nuns that are present on Octu that are sort of the shepherds of this strange island. Uh, you know, if you flip through goddesses, there's so much uh, frog imagery and, and figurines and whatnot. And I remember there's like a fish god that looks very, very similar to the to those nuns as well goddess yeah yeah super identical there's also a figure in goddesses and i i don't have it for reference off the top of my head but it looks a lot like the giant uh sea creature that uh (laughs) yes yes yes, yes. so it just feels like this sort of fertile ground really for where her story begins it feels so rooted just at least the imagery of it and it feels very primal like this location where the jedi were born it's like a very representative of birth you know like the everything is kind of back to basics in a way yeah even the scene i mean the moment when ray when she's connecting to the force and kind of puts her hand on the rock and sees life and everything Mm -hmm. it, it it feels so feminine and so 
yeah, just very earth, earth mothery. <laughs> yeah. And that's actually like a really important thing to point out, like Nat and I have discussed about, you know, femininity is not just, you know, kind of soft, you know, life giving. Yeah. It's also there's a little bit more to it than that. Yeah, it's also ugly and bloody sometimes. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I think this is a good opportunity to quote Maria Gambutas yeah. in regards to her take on the goddess. And uh, we'll go into some of the context for that. Goddesses is written by Joseph Campbell in terms of his lectures and his mm -hmm. workshops and stuff like that. But he's drawing a lot of inspiration from an anthropologist an archaeologist named Maria Gambutas, who was originally from Lithuania and then moved to the U.S. after, you know, both Nazi and Soviet occupation during World War II. And she did a lot of research in regards to Neolithic and uh, cultures to see, you know, in was there a history there for a patriarchal or God-based system? And her conclusion was that there was not, that there mm -hmm. was a goddess culture. So we'll talk about that a little bit more, but I do like her quote here. The goddess in all her manifestations was a symbol of the unity of all life in nature. Her power was in water and stone, in tomb and cave, in animals and birds, snakes and fish, hill, trees and flowers. And throughout the texts of goddesses and also through her work, she is pointing out that there's this water bird imagery. There's this, you know, like the frog fish imagery, you know, these things that are representative of the cycles of life and decay and that regeneration of that. Mm -hmm. And and her work was very important. And actually, uh, Joseph Campbell had said that if he had known about her work earlier, he would have considered almost everything differently. She's just such a fascinating figure. I, I was just rereading about her a little bit today. And uh, it's hard not to even just feel like she's <laughs> like sort of a correlated with Ray's journey a little bit. Yeah. And that, uh, she, you know, mm -hmm. so underestimated or, or whatever and was really kind of the the key holder of all of this knowledge that I don't know I was just really feeling the parallels there <laughs> she went through incredible troubles to actually be considered to be an authority an expert you know valuable uh to the anthropological field itself and in some ways her approach, it's almost like a very feminine approach to anthropology. She was like, so what's the meaning of all of this anthropology that we're finding? Like, what is the meaning behind it? The spiritual meaning? What did it mean for the people that were living? Um, whereas like people at the time were looking at um, what they were finding on these digs as like, okay, so what did they eat? How did they live? You know, really rather than like what did they believe and she was very much in that thread of <laughs> of discovery and and thought and even for many many years many people just kind of thought she didn't she kind of was almost fictionalizing what she saw but what they're finding is that she was very now with more evidence that they're they're like oh she was kind of right she was right in all of these different ways and and more evidence it especially DNA evidence, is showing how correct she actually was. Yeah, she definitely used her intuition yeah. and, you know, things that are kind of deemed almost, you know, sort of feminine stereotypical things that she used to analyze the stuff like her imagination and, and, and that intuition. And, you know, those things are sort of scoffed at sometimes from like an academic standpoint, but she proved that that instinct is actually really valuable. Yes, exactly. And what's, I find really interesting is that like many of the articles that we have on her were actually um, and and Nat that you pulled together um, were actually from Maureen, Maureen Murdoch. Yeah, Maureen Murdoch has been writing about her. And the recent article that I found was in 2016. Mm -hmm. And that just kind of proves that her legacy is so lasting within that community. Her, you know, if you look at the Joseph Campbell Library, it's been renamed to the Joseph Campbell and Maria Gambutas Library. <laughs> and, you know, the people are giving her the credit that is due, whether or not her work, you know, holds up in regards to the scientific basis, as much as we can criticize it, I do think that she was so influential in regards to our understanding of maybe a, a possible history where peace flourished because wasn't necessarily a matriarchal culture, but it was an egalitarian culture where women were valued and where women were worshipped as equals. And so mm -hmm. 
you know, that's, it's sort of a utopic ideal for us to fixate on, but you know, what is myth? It's a way for us to consider the possibilities outside of our norms that are more, you know, hopeful and inspired. Exactly. And so we've already kind of drawn some some brief parallels to to say like, okay, there's some influence here, especially in Campbell. And we know, we know nearing the end of Campbell's life, um, he's been quoted a couple of times actually saying, I'm working with George on his new movies. <laughs> I love this quote because he's like, <laughs> Like, what are you doing hanging out at Skywalker Ranch working with George Lucas on his new movies? And this was like in the late 80s, uh, just near the end of Campbell's life. He had been meeting with George Lucas and talking all about, you know, mythology, the the one myth, the stories. And that's why the Bill Moyers series is actually filmed at Skywalker Ranch. This one is so interesting to me because it's like he is actually having conversations with George Lucas around about what po- could potentially happen in the future. What, do you have any like speculation, Nat, on that? <laughs> All day, every day. I think, All day. <laughs> sorry. I, I'm one of those weirdos that thinks that George is still lurking behind the curtain in many ways. And I mean, they have said that he is like he's been contributing to the sequel trilogy. Yeah, absolutely. And to look mm-hmm. at what Campbell's focus was in later in life, like by the time that Campbell and Lucas became really close was actually after, you know, the original trilogy had been pretty much completed. Mm-hmm. And so he was looking to the future in regards to what kind of storytelling he wanted to say. And you can see an evolution in that. He already kind of had planned out what the prequel trilogy would be about and was building the mythology around that. But in terms of the sequel trilogy, when you look at his work after the prequel trilogy, you start to see this shift of focus towards a more, you know, feminine based storytelling, you know, whether it's releasing the Clone Wars with the female protagonist or, you know, allowing his daughter to help, you know, write certain arcs of that. Especially like romantic arcs, right? Mm -hmm. Because we now know that Dark Disciple um, was written by Katie Lucas. That was a full romantic arc that had been previously written, but was never able to be produced. Yeah. And, you know, on a metatextual level, there's this really obvious gesture towards including feminine voices and feminine perspectives within the storytelling, you know, from the bottom up. And I'm excited to see how that goes. But I also do think that just based on how big Lucasfilm is, how influential George Lucas is, and how he really responds to, you know, even to the point of building a museum around narrative art, he actually really fundamentally believes in the storytelling and in its origins as well, which is where I get the idea that, like, there is no way that he missed out on this or, like... (laughs) you know, overlooked this portion of Campbell's work. Yeah, I think it was it was very influential to Campbell at the end. Like he he was almost trying to like make up for mistakes of the past or like try to correct course correct near the end. Be like, you know, actually, these stories are very important and we should talk about them. I kind of want to pivot now and, and talk about the 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 feminine aspects of storytelling and especially the feminine symbolism Um, that we see that ties back to kind of these goddesses myths. Lindsay, I know that you you mentioned some of them, but um, did you want to kind of talk about any kind of specific ones that you've seen? Yeah, I mean, I I do think a lot of it we've talked about, you know, obviously, I I feel like The Last Jedi is where that feminine aspect really flourished, because I think it, it, you know, it's starting there in in The uh, Force Awakens. Mm -hmm. The Last Jedi is so internalized with Rey. There's so much just you know, I could get into the weeds in terms of just like the fact that even the trees are kind of, or the cave, uh, mm-hmm. you know, there's all these sort of, you know, female anatomy <laughs> symbology. <laughs> and a lot of that, it just feels like the movie's sort of pulsating with this feminine desire also, which is something that I've written a lot about, mm-hmm. you know, not just in the sort of literal aspects, but in the the cave imagery, once again, literally leaping into herself. Yeah, those are sort of the things that jump out to me. (laughs) I don't know if there's anything more specifically tied to myth that we want to talk about, but uh, just just the like pure literal aspects of kind of stepping into that world in that film just feels so linked there. I agree completely. Like the yonic symbolism around the mm-hmm. tree was one of those things that just spat out at you. And like also that that cave opening, the original concept art, having it be ringed with red seaweed instead of black seaweed, you know, like yeah. you can't yes. you can't get more like 
hit over the head as a woman with that kind of imagery, but I think it was lost on a lot of people. Um, one of my favorite ones that I don't see discussed very often is that the prime Jedi, to me, in terms of that mosaic that's within the cave above versus the cave below, you know, covered in water, mm-hmm. which is again a feminine symbol, is actually, if you look at it from an art history kind of basis, it is a feminine figure. She's holding, you know, this kind of black darkness between her legs and there's more dark than light on that actual mosaic and there's this like whole idea like if the prime jedi was female and like the beginning of this thing and this whole island imagery is around the feminine you know what has been missing this entire time in regards to do we not understand what the feminine principles of a real jedi order would have been you know would we have not stepped into you know these prototypical masculine traits of aggression or war if we would have you know focused more on the sort of feminine side of spirituality. Yeah, and it's very interesting because like the Jedi, the you know, a Jedi is about compassion, right? And it's like, but yet we're going to war, you know, ex- aggressive negotiations, like all of this aggression is very based in in the Jedi itself in the modern modern period of time, especially the prequels era. Um, but like, what was it way back when? Although we don't see the male caretakers who go out and fish and everything like that, why is it an island of women? <laughs> <laughs> who have healthy sexual lives, apparently. Yeah. You know, they're partying as soon as their men come home. Like, there's yeah. really great stuff there. <laughs> it really is. And yeah, you're right. There's tons of female imagery. Like, I've made jokes when we did a, a podcast like review of the last Jedi on the show, and literally, I'm sitting here with two guys talking about the last Jedi. I'm like, look at all these lady caves, like especially <laughs> like the one on crate when literally there's like he walks through a hole that's very similar to a vagina, and like he walks out, <laughs> and then like there's all these like lines of like blood. It's like, what is going on in this movie? <laughs> It's so true. I've had so many conversations with men who are just like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, no, literally the cave on Oct 2 is like a, an open vagina <laughs> that she walks into. Yep. You know, it's like, there's so much of it that I think women just see a little bit differently. The tree of knowledge or the t- the, the original temple or whatever, the cave or the tree cave or whatever it is, kind of looks like a uterus. Like, yeah, there's so much like it's almost like too much when you think about it, like the uh, throne room kind of looks like womb like or like sexualized because of the red. And then they have this like hot and sweaty fight. It's very <laughs> sexual in it. I mean, like and and then like they there's like the whole hand touch scene, which is hot. And like Ryan Johnson has you know, said it's the closest thing we'll get to a sex scene. Like everything is hypersexualized from a symbolic perspective and feminized, sexualized, and even just like, you know, even the milking of the Thalus siren is very feminine. And like when you read like how men who seem to not have ever gone to sex ed uh, react (laughs) to it, it's wacky. It's like, that's how much we're missing femininity in our culture, but also in our Star Wars. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, not to bring like Kylo directly into it, but that same thing seems to be lost. I think some, so many women see something very different between scenes between Rey and Kylo than, than men do. I still have men telling me that they think they're related, whatever. (laughs) And, you know, theories can be whatever, but it's just funny, like how different a woman would see that like elevator scene versus a man. It's so true. That elevator scene. (laughs) so much there (laughs) i mean like specifically like what do you see Lindsay? i mean i feel like we probably see the same thing but like what's going on in that elevator scene (laughs) i mean i see the whole entire movie as sort of an allegory for ray's like sexual awakening Mm -hmm. you know and i think that elevator scene is sort of the most primal in terms of that it's really her confronting this you know, from my perspective, I can't say that this is accurate, but from my perspective, uh, this woman confronting this this man that she's been having these connections with and that she feels so forcefully drawn to. And um, yeah, so that's just where all the, all the tension is on the table. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like when you're encountering your crush in a closed space, <laughs> there's, you know, so much that you can read it's into like that. like electricity, and, you know, yeah. almost. Yeah, yeah. Like it's electric. <laughs> totally. And like, like he waits for her, he greets her at the door. I mean, the door to yeah, the pod, yeah. but you know. I mean, 
She's also in handcuffs. But, yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and she moves towards him and she yeah. takes it like she yeah. and she offers help and she, you know, and it's great to see that sort of like, you know, that initiation be on her part because she's not really aware. I don't think I think she's moving on a subconscious level, but it's there like she's drawn to that in a way that, you know, speaks to all of our experience when our, you know when we're sexually activated, <laughs> yeah. which all women go through at some point, or, you know, it's in some way. Yeah. Tying back to the mythological aspects of, of goddesses and, and, and definitely seeing the parallels there, especially with uh, some of the imagery, the, these figures that um, Joseph Campbell calls out, which, you know, part of it is um, Maria Gambutis's work in finding them is like, finding these figurines and saying look these female these this feminine imagery is across europe and before kind of the indo-europeans kind of took over and kind of changed the culture in some ways um there was this society of equals out there in europe and when that changed kind of the iconography and the focus on these on these goddesses disappeared so by pulling the parallels to what we've found anthropologically out there it's like in some ways kind of speaking to this symbolic language that maybe we aren't we aren't even aware of uh from a you know, a feminine perspective, because, you know, not everybody goes to school for this. Yeah, I think definitely something that stands out to me, the more I was reading about the computer stuff, was basically that I feel like the new trilogy, the sequel trilogy has felt way more about pacifism than uh, past Star Wars Mm -hmm. movies, you know, it's way more about moving away from violence, uh, using instinct and using good over evil um you know the sort of jedi trick of which which luke does at the end of the last Mm -hmm. jedi which is using his lightsaber not for force but you know to sort of deflect and and for for positive reasons um which just seems like something that really can be it's upset certain fans that he didn't just go out you know (laughs) fighting but it feels like it's rooted in some of this which is like getting back to this world where violence is not a necessary aspect of of the universe and where conflict can only be resolved with sort of a moving away from that exactly nat yeah i think that's really clear within the text like you said there and and it's also much more clear if you you know look at the sort of men's mythopoeic movement and lies influence in regards to ryan johnson writing that you know Mm -hmm. we need to cultivate positive male archetypes and roles that don't necessarily lean back on this idea that men are inherently violent or aggressive. And, and, and Lucas has always been very much an advocate for nonviolence and for, you know, sort of like the, the loss of ego that comes from, you know, going into like Zen Buddhist kind of ideals that were originally part of the Jedi and why they went wrong, you know. Um, but from like the feminine perspective in regards to these cultures and this history that, you know, I would say existed, there's the idea that you don't require that in order to, you know, live a full life. And we've gotten away from that. We've, we've trivialized the importance of family and nurturing and um, you know, just generally, I'm sorry. Community? Community. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Protecting people around you and taking care of people around you. Because the way that Gimbutas frames it, these were very communal societies. There was shared property. They didn't, they had an abundance versus a lack. They didn't go out looking for things and or, or looking for other civilizations to conquer because they were content with like the shared wealth across that community. And their mythology sort of reflected that. They, they, which, which is really interesting is that Gimbutas is from Lithuania, which is um, a Baltic region. The, the Baltic, sorry, the Baltic region wasn't Christianized until like the 16th century. Mm-hmm. And they ma- maintained a lot of their mythology and folklore. But it is one of the absolute few cultures in existence that has a female solar goddess. And so the whole oh, idea around... <laughs> it's super interesting. I don't... I... You know, <laughs> yeah. So, um, in Latvia and Lithuania, Sala is the goddess of the sun, and her tears are amber, and that's like the regional amber. If you've ever been around there, but and the ma- the masculine is encompassed in the moon, and so there there's not like 
this sense of like a, a sun god that like is a conqueror that sort of goes out and takes over everything. There's this whole idea that the sun is nurturing life and it's a feminine presence and it's, you know, it's life feeds life kind of thing. It's interesting to see how we don't really have that kind of imagery, but in goddesses, it's, it's very much called out in terms of, well, the newer cultures did, they, they replaced the sun goddess with a sun god. And mm -hmm. that's where you get sort of like your, <laughs> we could go for hours on this topic, but. No, continue. Sorry. It replaced with the sun god, which kind of, uh, I don't know, brought brought the patriarchy, I guess, <laughs> in some way. Like, like that's what you're trying to say, right? Like, it changed the focus from this kind of feminine life giver power to almost like destructive masculine power. Yeah, and I think like it's interesting to relate to Star Wars because you do have like the whole imagery of the suns related to the Skywalkers and that kind of thing. But like yeah. we've talked about before, you know, Kylo brings out a lot of interesting characteristics and in how people see him because he's related more to sort of feminine emotions, mm -hmm. you know, whether it be being very more emotionally on the surface, you know, having that kind of rage and that and those tears. tears. Yeah. <laughs> um you know, you don't really see that when it comes to sort of like your conqueror king imagery. Um, what you do see, though, is that that's really related more to, I would say, you know, like the feminine aspect of like that. That's why a lot of women relate to him and understand him a little bit better, I think. Um, whereas Ray, you have your, I would say that she does have solar goddess imagery. I, Lindsay, you, you have to help me with this one, but <laughs> she's definitely like you know, portrayed as being sort of having these masculine traits and like born on a desert planet with aridity and like this kind of spiritual stagnation. She doesn't have the water of life, which is representative of feminine. So where is she going with this? Well, The Last Jedi, she's literally immersed in water and baptized into this new life. Yep. And, it, and is fascinated by water, right? Yeah. Like, because yeah. when she holds her hand out to the rain, she's like, you know, what is this? Oh, my God. She's she's uh, she almost lights up. I love Daisy's smile in that scene when she's like, <laughs> rain. Like, what is this? Yeah, it's the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's so interesting. I guess I've never really thought about Kylo as being the sun figure there. And I, I do agree with you that there's so much myth that ties men to these solar powers. Um, I always saw it sort of in reverse, you know, Ray is literally, her name evokes sunlight to me, mm -hmm. Ray of light. And so I always sort of saw her as the sun figure and, and Kylo as the moon figure and that they work in these sort of polarities. But hearing that he, you know, the way that you put that definitely makes me rethink that. And now I want to go back in and read goddesses with some of that. In oh, mind. no, I think he just, I think you're completely right. Like he subverts that Skywalker sun kind of idea, right? Like he's not you know, following the footsteps of Anakin and Luke, who were yeah. similar to that. He's absolutely more on the moon side, the feminine side of like how we think of things. And, you know, like, n never really thought of like, the idea of the moon being a masculine symbol, but it's, you know, it's constantly being reborn and changed. And I right. think that relates to like, it, it supports the thesis that Rey is a solar goddess in some ways that she's like kind of a shining light for the galaxy and taking that king yeah. position. And uh, and, and Kylo is depressed and in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. He's also, you know, the moon is, it's written a lot in goddesses and throughout Campbell's stuff that the moon's constantly being sacrificed to, you know, whether it's for nighttime or, or whatnot, mm -hmm. but that makes me think so much about you know, it makes my mind go off about where the story will will head with him and how much it will you adhere mean, to that. You mean like some sort of sacrifice that will potentially end up in rebirth, like the moon? <laughs> yes, exactly. So is that is that, that exactly what you're thinking I'm of? <laughs> that is almost exactly. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. and yeah, like don't want to be Nat and I uh, like are both kind of in that. Like I very much view Anakin's. Anakin's story continuing on with Kylo like he's almost like fulfilling the role of Vader Anakin in the story whether that's you know reverse Anadella only symbolically or actually truthfully he's very much like he's down to the boots he's literally wearing the same boots as Anakin in the prequels <laughs> Like, I hate to, like, yeah. call out costuming, but, like, they, they're making it very apparent that they're fulfilling these archetypical roles from a symbolic perspective. And it, it's just, like, yeah, he he's fulfilling this, like, potential reborn, like, version of this 
first moon figure, which is awesome. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He even like shrugs his shawl off the same way <laughs> and like has the same floppy, like long hair in the face. And scar so, on his eye. Think, yeah, the parallels are so extreme. Uh, that's what I love about him. <laughs> the Star Wars it rhymes, as everybody says. Um, <laughs> it <yes>. does. <laughs> <laughs> so where were you going the regeneration or the of the moon can you talk a little bit more about that I mean I don't have any strong mythical basis in that I just think my mind is always constantly thinking about <laughs> the rise of Skywalker literally just it's my job to constantly be thinking of that but also uh yeah I mean I don't know exactly what I, I think it looks like in terms of how it relates to myth but I do think that Kylo is, is being set up for that sort of sacrificial uh rebirth whatever it looks like now that we know palpatine is involved mm-hmm. i'm sure that will have something to do with it um and just but knowing that the sun works in such tandem with the moon and knowing how ray will will fit into that is something that intrigues me to no end <laughs> nat yeah i think i've got some quotes from goddesses here that can probably help <laughs> here's a few if you don't mind me doing this <laughs> sure yeah of course no um so the bull like we've related it earlier so for some context of people that didn't actually see the thread we were talking about how ray jumping over the tie fighter looks like bull leaping from the minoan culture and the bull represents the lunar aspect of and also a masculine aspect within this goddess's you know theory and it was a sacrificial animal you never sacrificed female animals you only sacrificed the male bull because they were the female already contains life death and rebirth within her and so she doesn't need to be resurrected after you know through the act of sacrificing it for the use of food or for the use of like you know speaking to the gods so count that one out and like a theory of course for the rise of skywalker is that the the male will be sacrificed and we've seen it with anakin as well like he was the sacrificial child as much as he was the divine birth the virgin mm-hmm. birth it's a very common motif throughout history if you look at stuff like the greeks Eleusinian mysteries which was covered in the book as well that is a whole sacred mystery right around this idea of this sacrificial boy king you know that is you know initiating yourself into adulthood would be to go through that um the goddesses would take you down into the underworld quote unquote in order for you to be reborn and to experience the breadth of life so but one of my favorite quotes from here is about sacrifice it's the animal or the young person sacrificed was to be perfect anyone with a flaw was unworthy to be sacrificed and so the king himself was the primary sacrifice one never finds a picture of him old. And I like that idea with Kylo in regards to him coming into this place of actually having power and actually being able to try to implement some sort of, I wouldn't say necessarily good, but what he thinks is right within the yeah. context of that. There is a sort of almost a sacrifice being made because either like his people will turn against him, <laughs> right? Or it will happen. Yeah, like, or, you know, Palpatine will have shadow power and influence what he is trying to do that is actually good through, you know, his agents. You know, um, we know that there's going to be red stormtroopers that are called Sith troopers. There's a lot going on. And I can definitely see him, Kylo, attempting to do good and how that, like, in his own mind, whatever that is. But certainly trying to make things right in his way or work. Yeah, and learning how to work in relation to Ray. A- another quote from Goddesses Nat, I believe you pulled this out, but it's something that I actually have, had highlighted recently as well, so we're on the same page. But um, it talks about the, the realization uh, that the two are one and our t- eternal and temporal life are one, which is something that that feels so related to Ray and Kylo. It just like makes my head spin around <laughs> in a yes. good way. Um, but yeah, just the, this idea that the two must exist together for this balance to, to recur also feels like masculinity and femininity having to exist together. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I'm really, really interested to see how that sacrifice and potential rebirth, what, it, what that looks like in terms of the story. Like they can't exist apart because only yeah. then you actually have balance. And we know that <laughs> symbiosis, especially in the prequel trilogy, was always a big question you know you can't have one without the other the Naboo and the Gungans can't exist without each other there has to be and 
very much there's a lot of quotes about how like people who have been talking about the sequel trilogy and how nine or the rise of skywalker will finish everything up is all focused on the idea that you know balance um it's going to make the whole saga make sense so we have to think about kind of what are the themes that have been important the whole like nine movies and how those are going to kind of play out in episode nine and balance is is a huge one of course yeah it seems to be the sort of sole marketing tool that they're using too right like ray and kylo both symbolize this balance and everything that we've gotten so far whether it's the art book you know that's showing the two of them parallel the vanity fair covers that are just those two characters and no one else involved it's it's really playing that very out. very much like it's them they are the two halves of the same protagonist in ryan johnson's quote yeah yeah absolutely and they continue to be <laughs> it's like a self self-fulfilling prophecy if you pay attention to the marketing <laughs> yes yes absolutely <laughs> um so what are some other aspects of like masculinity and femininity that we see in like the goddesses book that are kind of present in the sequel trilogy that we can definitely call on to Nat? Well, I think one of the most interesting things about goddesses in terms of the way that Joseph Campbell is writing about this is that he is dichotomizing, you know, the feminine and the masculine in regards to sort of like the physical manifestation of your life and your existence versus the ego death and like the the separation from time and space where you right. can kind of see things in a larger picture, which is really interesting. Like I think he was really probably thinking about that at the end of life kind of thing. And like you'll find that with a lot of philosophers or psychologists that are, you know, growing older, they're really focused on this idea of moving past our simple ideas of life and death into more ideas of cosmic consciousness. And he uses, you know, kind of the, you know, the feminine initiation within the mysteries in order to kind of explain how you become, you have your spiritual rebirth into, you know, your ascended state. And uh, the women, the woman is the guide point on that. And it kind of goes back to what he was saying about women don't need to do the journey because they're already there, you know? <laughs> like, right. They just need to realize that they've been the goddess the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I have a quote here. Now I have pointed out that the sun, which has no shadow within it and which represents life eternal, is a symbol of consciousness disengaged in the field of time and space. The moon, however, which dies and is resurrected monthly is exactly consciousness within the field of time and space. The realization is that the two are one, that our eternal and temporal life are one. We are not to ask, shall I be alive after my death, but to experience the eternal principle here and now. And what I find interesting about this is like, we're getting into the weird with Star Wars. We Yeah, that's very that. force, uh, like Yoda quotes, like, uh, don't feel bad for people who have gone into the force because you know they're they're there now you know they're with the Mm -hmm. eternal huh it's a different way of looking at death because i think a lot of the finality around it is part of our culture in regards to how we view you know like sort of when you come you know you look at something that's a children's movie versus something that's maybe a little bit more you know made for adults and a little bit more nihilistic we're looking at the idea of how do we portray death as as a as a form of ascension versus a form of tragedy and I think that we're going to kind of see that a lot with regards to the sequel trilogy in terms of the spiritual aspect of it, not necessarily your more temporal, like, war side of it. Your war side of it speaking about how, like, we're literally sacrificing all these lives in this kind of pointless conflict that's been going on since people were before people were born. How do we end it? How do we transcend this? How do we move past this into a place where, you know, life and death has meaning? Right. And and how do we kind of get over the endless Star Wars in some way? <laughs> right? Like that like that's the point is like how do we solve the imbalance within the galaxy? How do we solve the imbalance within ourselves? Um and how do we how do we stop the endless cycle of what you said this this pain like this um you know the uh, having to live through because living as much as like star wars is so awesome and so cool i would not want to live in that galaxy like it's horrible (laughs) to constantly be subjected to 
um, you know, this imperialistic rule or, you know, constant wars, like it, it's hard. It's hard to live there. Yeah, it's it's interesting to, to wonder, like, you know, to take it back to computers, this whole thing, uh, her concept of old Europe, as she deemed it, was something, you know, a group of people who were unafraid of death mm-hmm. because their lives were so fulfilled. They just saw it as a natural progression until the Indo-Europeans came in and brought with them all of these, you know, weapons that that she sort of became depressed about <laughs> mm-hmm. from studying for too long. Um, and so just this idea, you know, just Star Wars, does it end at the end by going back to that kind of way of life? And is it the same idea there? Um, and I don't know, does, <laughs> I guess Star Wars has to end with taking the wars <laughs> out of the stars. Uh, <laughs> Is it is this the the end of all the Star Wars? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Is it truly the end of all the Star Wars? And is there the only way that they can tell stories is by going back even more? I, I don't know, but it sets up an interesting possibility if that is sort of the the natural end of this. Saga. Is the end of the Skywalker saga the end of the Star Wars? Oh man, that's an amazing <laughs> question. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it's not <laughs> just because like, people like money. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. It's it's not because capitalism. But, um, <laughs> I do think after this stage of, you know, after the Skywalker saga is ending, I'm sure they'll go back to the sort of ancient times. Yeah. Uh, I would guess. I feel like they'll take some time before they realize what the next sort of iteration of the galaxy looks like beyond this. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see how much of this sort of mythic idea they carry into the future, <laughs> not just the past. Yeah, like if, you know, what stories happen after the the end. And like, I very much, um, I've mused a lot in the last little while that I feel like the Force is going to fundamentally change with the end yes. of the Skywalker saga. So if they want to tell the Force as it currently exists, they have to go into the past. It's like maybe the Force leaves the galaxy and kind of like that's the end or like, you know, or yeah. like that nobody has superpowers or everybody has superpowers. Like, I, I'm not sure what's going to happen, but I feel like there's going to be some sort of significant change that kind of marks the, you know, the fact that this, like why Anakin Skywalker was born, all of these different steps and trials and Star Wars that have happened during the Skywalker saga, something fundamentally should shift about the galaxy. I agree completely. I think it's moving past this idea of polarization or supreme mm-hmm. dichotomy between good and evil and black and white and that kind of thing and understanding it more from not only a mythic perspective, but more our Christian values that are more good and evil and right and wrong exist and, you know, male and female, all these kind of ideas that are, you know, we do exist with the necessary binaries that you know everything exists with the binary but we can go into more nuance about like what that relates to with the force because so far it's been pretty cut and dry you know like yeah people running around wearing black with red lightsabers ooh, they're evil <laughs> when you know our our world is a lot more nuanced than that and you know the principles behind the force and the usage of it have always been nuanced they just haven't been expressed that way mostly because this is of course kind of a simple story about conflict yeah and you know it's a story to to teach children how to grow up too right it's for kids (laughs) yeah absolutely (laughs) i mean kylo kylo is an overgrown child (laughs) which is totally (laughs) fine and that's why kids relate to him because he expresses all the things that you know you you go through when you are like literally developmentally stunted yep outward aggression inability to relate to other people like feelings of isolation and as much as we make fun of that we're living in a time where a lot of us actually still feel that in our 30s <laughs> later i love seeing pictures of kids running up to kylo at galaxy's edge <laughs> knocking him it's like my pure joy whenever i see one come across my timeline like these little kids they're just like that guy that guy needs a hug i want to hug him <laughs> <laughs> they get it <laughs> they they get that like you know the mask is literally his persona that he's put on and that he's not actually that and that he's probably something squishy on the inside <laughs> yeah there, there's even that Campbell quote from goddesses I don't have it offhand but he does say the mask he who wears the mask is two people so yep. uh, yeah yeah 
definitely true of Kylo. Yeah, he's the one wearing the mask, and he is the mask that's that's worn. That is the mask of the yes. rules. Like I'm really looking at it right now, so it's yes. like, yay! Um, <laughs> I was paraphrasing. No, it's so true. <laughs> I it um, yeah, I just love that idea, and it's part of the ritual of initiation. Mm-hmm. It, it's taking yeah. on a role that is outside of your own experience in order to try and assume it. But in order for you to assume that role, you do have to go through the trial in order and and your own journey and you have to have male mentorship you have to have your separation from your mother your feminine you know overarching figure in your life Mm -hmm. so all sorts of fun stuff there with kylo i have been obsessed with him as the idea of being a sacrificial child since the force awakens because his life was literally taken away from him before he was even a teen in canon if you look at it Mm mm-hmm yeah, and I wonder what that means now that his mask is is cracked and sort of glued back together in The Rise of Skywalker, what that represents necessarily. Oh boy. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Probably a lot. <laughs> oh, like I I don't I don't see any sort of mythological parallels to this, but I really I really hope that at some point he's not wearing the mask and somebody else is to like pretend Ooh. to be him. That would be very cool. <laughs> like very much like gra- like grandma used to do, like the decoy maneuver. Yeah, not to get too speculative <laughs> with just like my own theorizing, but in the trailer, it's not him rebuilding the masks. It's like a furry hand doing yep. it. So part of me even wonders if he wears it at all uh, or, you know, if it's just being glued back together for some sort of preservation reasons. But yeah, I don't know. I'm really interested in that mask. <laughs> I think we will see him wear it because like he's on the... I, he he was on the celebration poster and it's like you don't know, put like his oh, right. his like lackey to the third to the left in the celebration poster in the mask <laughs> even even just like pretending but i i think that it would be really cool to actually see him share that persona that he's he's so far removed from it that he can actually give it to somebody else yeah, yeah. And be really cool. Super, super obsessed with the idea of the relation between Kylo and Padme versus Kylo and Anakin, because obviously there is so much between Kylo and Anakin that you can podcast about a whole, you know, like a whole episode about it. <laughs> hey, but, <laughs> stop calling me out. No, yeah, just I listen to it. But the whole idea that he's like Padme is much more interesting and unique to me because if you, and even on a mythological structure, if you look at, you know, Anakin, sun god, Padme, moon goddess, this whole like, they're even reflected within the droids themselves because mm-hmm. you look at C-3PO and R2-D2. There's, anyway, yeah, there's mm-hmm. a whole discussion that Marie Claire has done stuff on <laughs> about how they relate to the actual thing. I'm just like freaking out. Sorry. I love it. <laughs> I love it so much that they like uh, fulfill almost um, their archetypical roles to each other in uh, throughout the storytelling. And they, they fulfill the role of mom and dad almost in a way to the children to their children and they guide them and to adulthood, which is crazy. It's kind of fun um, because, you know, Luke is not actually an adult when we meet him in A New Hope. So is anybody an adult in Star Wars? <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Chewbacca. Yeah. yeah. He's just like too old for this. <laughs> yeah. All of these, all of these kids are his pets. Yes. <laughs> Not vice versa. <laughs> it's like if the family dog adopted you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's really weird to think about. I'm going to stop now. <laughs> um. So you wanted to bring up actually a term, Nat. Um, so you're, you're going to have to try to pronounce it. All about Rey and, and her role within the saga. Yeah, I'm going to have to pronounce the term regeneratrix. <laughs> which is from Maria Gambutas. She said that she didn't focus on the goddess as being just a you know life bringer or a death wielder, but as a regenitrix. Like her whole point was the fact that you you know sacrifice the bull in order to get you know a better harvest or to actually feed your people. You know everything that is killed is brought back into life, just like we see in the motif from the Last Jedi, where they talk you know decay. death and rebirth. Yes. Yep, decay and new life. Yeah, it's perfect encapsulation of that concept. So the point being that there is no other aspect outside of like, you know, a literal death and resurrection, which I believe strongly in, but also you can, you can focus that in terms of 
is she going to regenerate the galaxy in right. terms of for the force like the force awakens then there's the last jedi who you know could be her could be kylo could be any, all of us and then the rise of skywalker and bringing back and symbolically resurrecting the skywalker family becoming sort of a matriarch figure even no i'm not mm-hmm. saying she's gonna have children per se but well, she, she could <laughs> but she takes on that role of motherhood from somebody like leia who yeah her story is past so you know it's a figurative cultural role to play is to become the mother of the new force or the new order or whatever occurs after this and it and it very much heals the missing feminine that happens within uh the prequels with you know shmi dying and the separation from anakin and his mother padme's death the um mortis arc where we literally don't know where the mother of mortis is like there's the this idea of the missing feminine throughout the story and her taking on that feminine matriarch role although not a matriarchy (laughs) uh, fulfills the equality in the story that is missing yeah yeah absolutely i'm so interested to see the thing that i'm the most curious about with rise of skywalker is where it it literally ends you know like does it end with us seeing what that next generation or that next iteration of the force is or does it end before that and that's like a story for (laughs) another time or tie-in materials or, or some what sort of return uh, of the jedi <laughs> celebration with yub nub they're gonna bring it back right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know i i have it like in my head that it'll end on tatooine just that seems like something that will happen but i just mean like even in terms of if right does it end on on her just like internalizing this new thing or do we actually see it do we see her rebuild a jedi temple or or whatever it ends up being uh, I'm so curious and so anxious about it. Yeah, also. the anxiety is high for me as well. I'm very, yeah. you know, like it, we have so many cultural touchstones that we can feed back on like Harry Potter or like other mm-hmm. things where it's like we kind of see the ending of the story told. And I think I've just been surrounded by a lot of theories from women in regards to do we see her, you know, I, I think honestly seeing her take care of the children of the galaxy in some way or another is pretty expected almost yeah like the children of the force that are out there is that what you're thinking yeah she's gonna hand broom boy a lightsaber and that's the final (laughs) shot (laughs) be like come here my children yeah yeah and like uh christy carew who does like the music episodes meta music with me she's like i totally expect her to be holding a baby or to be pregnant or (laughs) something she really (laughs) she really wants that continuation of like you know like the line that the Skywalker like DNA in some ways, you know, to say like it's it's now healed and the family is whole again, you know, and that it's mm-hmm. equal and balanced and things are things are right. Finally, I I honestly don't know. I've gone back and forth. I feel like Ray and Kylo are going to go out and become moisture farmers. I've said that for a while. Like, just go and become, like, farmers somewhere. Like, that's very, like, you know, and kind of maybe exist in a, you know, yeah, we train on the force, but we also grow crops kind of way. Very back back to kind of nature, uh, maybe on Naboo, mm-hmm. being kind of like the <laughs> birthplace of that line <laughs> in some ways from, from their perspective. But I... I'd, I just want it to be satisfying, I guess. Yeah. I have such a very specific image in my mind of how I think it will end. And this might be corny and not true, but it does feel like it kind of relates to what we've been talking about, which is I feel like, a, again, I feel like this is completely just my own. That's theory, okay. But, we support um, it. It ended. We support <laughs> I feel like in my, in my brain it ends with, uh, with them back on Tatooine kind of, you know, Kyle as a rebirth as Ben Solo and then standing there and ending on an image of the two of them standing watching the twin mm-hmm. sons, oh. sort of representative of the twin sons <laughs> themselves. Uh, yeah, that's becoming that's kind of moisture cool. farmers. Yes, it, <laughs> your theory also. Yes, excellent. <laughs> I see it like a desert garden kind of situation. I mean, there's no problem, there's no question that, you know, they could create something new on a previously right. dead world. I mean, that, and that would also um, point to this idea that there are um, 
like the rebirth happening in these dead planets has happened and that there's a significant change to the galaxy that way too, right? That would be so cool because like uh, Tatooine and like Mustafar and many of these mining worlds used to be lush and beautiful. And they're no longer that way. They're now dead planets, which is really fascinating from a symbolic perspective. Yeah. Yeah. So them standing there could be like a rebirth of that planet as well as just a a rebirth of the force. All these different things at once. I love that imagery. I'm going to gravitate towards that for my theories. Thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) That's so that's so great. I I really like that idea. And I want to say, like, well, first, thank you for joining this conversation and like having this, yeah. this crazy thing and bringing both of your expertise into this and, and speculation too, because that's so much fun. But I feel like it's such a positive idea. Like, no one's ever really gone. You know, we have this idea mm-hmm. that we can come back from either the mistakes that we've made. We can be reborn in ourselves and also we can heal, you know, the pain, the war, the mistakes of the galaxy um, is such a positive idea. And like, that's what I want from my, you know, uh, fairy tale in space, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> Same. <laughs> I think it's kind of necessary nowadays, unfortunately. I fear for like the next generation and their sense of hope in regards to what they're surrounded by. And I want to, you know, reiterate that it's not bad to have hope in storytelling, especially for younger generations. We and also showing that people can be redeemed from a dark place because they went down the wrong path. Absolutely important for everybody, not just children to kind of be able to see. And if it's framed mythologically, it's it's much more easy to parse versus something that's set in our world or our current context, which is kind of awful. Yeah, so. yeah, it's great. Yeah, I've definitely seen people kind of have a difficulty of separating Star Wars from that mythological thing and sort of applying real world morality to it. Mm-hmm. And that can be disappointing because it's, it's not that, uh, even though I get the, the desire to sort of relate the two. Yeah. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see the the reaction to it if it does go that more mythological route of you know being all about redemption, which I think it will. But <laughs> some people I know that will they'll sit poorly with. Yeah, so. we've been seeing that since 2015. It's just <laughs> okay. Fiction is not reality, and especially not in this context. Um, you know, you know, is- you know what's really fascinating? Like um, the one episode that. Um, I did on the heroine's journey and, you know, the feminine gaze, which like this very much ties into that, that episode and like their, their companions, their friends even, um, is that like, I've had so many messages, like tons of messages from guys that are like, you know, I never really knew what was missing kind of in my own life until I listened to this episode. Wow. That's awesome. Because it's like, you know. (laughs) And maybe that's something that we'll get from the whole sequel trilogy as a whole. I really, I really have hopes that like, because it's fiction and because it's told and because it's going to make sense of not only their childhood, the thing that they saw when they were kids, but also kind of the prequels that maybe didn't land for them or whatever, but it's going to make, the hope is that it'll make everything kind of fit together and make sense. And it's going to tell them look, there's hope for you. There's, um, you you were always missing those feminine aspects of yourself and you didn't know it. Uh, and you're going to be okay. And maybe, maybe if we're very lucky, it'll speak to some people's, you know, subconscious and tickle that part of their brains that they've been denying. I have hope. (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) so do i i love that i hope that that's what people are able to take from it but it it ends on a a note of peace for the films and for the fandom yeah (laughs) one can only hope although some of those subconscious reactions have been very knee-jerk and (laughs) i think i what i really hope for along those exact lines is just a return to a focus and a study of feminine storytelling and also an elevation of women writers and directors and Mm -hmm. 
everything. Like it's just been so missing and so lacking that it's almost seen as novel now for us to, well, it is seen as novel for us to have these stories told and it really shouldn't be. Yeah. It should be uh, equal, but just <laughs> kind of part of the norm, everybody. Right. And, and that's what, I think that's what our mythopoeia is telling us. Our zeitgeist even is saying, look, look at the missing feminine. Maybe we should be paying attention to her. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you should be. <laughs> she was here in the corner screaming the entire time. <laughs> <Just Yes>. listening. <laughs> yes, exactly. All right. So Nat, do you have anything else to add? No, I appreciate being on the podcast with you guys and you listening to me rant for an hour or so sorry nothing you do is ranting it's all beautiful it is i really appreciate everything that you <laughs> said. it gives me so much food for thought too it's there's a lot of missing gaps in some of my own understanding of this stuff so uh, yeah <laughs> i'm excited to continue reading stuff and just yeah filling in those gaps that's so great so uh lindsay where can people find you yeah, you can find me uh, on Twitter. I'm very active on Twitter uh, at Lindsay Romaine, just my full name. Uh, and then you can also find my writing on Nerdist.com. Awesome. And Nat, where can people find you? Before where you can find me, I just want to say that follow Lindsay because she has amazing insight into not only Star Wars, but also film. And I've been following her for quite some time before we even interacted online. And I'm very much a fangirl. So sorry, I'm no. <laughs> just going to shout you out. No. <laughs> Thank you so much. The feeling is very, very mutual. I promise you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you can find me at Ashes for Foxes on Twitter. I also host the podcast Meta Machina. That's spelled M E T A M A S H I N A. We talk about genre fiction from the feminine perspective. Awesome. Thank you both for coming on the show, and I'm looking forward to digging into all of the things that you said and thinking about them for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Hi, everyone. Thank you for listening to What the Force. And I wanted to let you know that I'm actually going to be taking two weeks off. So this episode is coming out on July 22nd. We will be back officially as of August 12th with a whole ton of amazing content. I'm actually going to be attending Gen Con in the US. And unfortunately, I can't guarantee that I will have access to the internet <laughs> while I'm there other than paying a lot, a lot of money for hotel internet, just the hotel that we've, we're staying at um, won't guarantee it. So uh, I've decided to just take a little mini break over the summer while I'm at Gen Con. During that time, I totally recommend that you go back through and listen to your favorite episodes. I'm actually going to be posting on Twitter my favorite episodes through the course of the time off and just kind of reliving some of my favorite time with certain guests and different topics that I have taken on over the time that What the Force has been live and bringing you this fun podcast to your ears. Thank you for listening, of course, every single week and tuning into what I have to say. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. It was a lot of fun to record with Lindsay and Nat, and they brought a lot of insight. And this is very much a companion to, to podcasts we will have in the future. This is very much a companion to some of the topics that we'll be tackling in August, as well as to the other myth and symbolism topic that Ty and I have talked about previously. I actually wanted to talk about that briefly because uh, recently I recorded with Ty and this episode will be coming out in August and it's all going to be, it's going to be a Power of Myth and Symbolism episode on the shadow. And almost unconsciously, <laughs> Ty and I have ex been exploring the Jungian aspects of the psyche. So one of our first episodes, I think it was our third episode, we explored the concept of masks in Star Wars. And that is actually a Jungian concept. It it takes on the persona, who they hide themselves, what what we put out there into the world of our mask and, and what we don't want people to see within ourself. 
We also talked about um, the feminine and especially the missing feminine within the saga itself and within Star Wars and how the sequel trilogy is really answering that question. And we, we very much dug into that again in this episode that you just listened to. Uh, and that very much ties into the anima and the animus aspect of Jungian psychology. And now we're going to be digging into the shadow. And so if you want to get caught up with what we are going to be talking about, this is your opportunity. I'm letting you know before it comes out. So in August, we will be talking about on the power of myth and symbolism, all about the human shadow. And we're going to be referencing Jungian concepts, as well as Robert Blythe, and especially his book, a little book on the human shadow. And I want to point out that both of these books were very influential on especially Ryan Johnson as he was writing The Last Jedi. So definitely worth checking out in prep for our episode that is coming out in August. So Thank you, thank you, thank you always for listening to What the Force. I really, really appreciate it. Again, I <laughs> I kind of always do this for myself, but I love that listeners give me feedback and appreciate all about what's happening. I always have to thank Ty Black for coming along on this journey. She makes the thumbnails that we post for videos as well as on Twitter and out there. And she's always there to listen to me. Um, recently as well, Nat Fox has been there from an audio drama perspective to run fangirling, but also to just bounce ideas off of. So thank you again. Thank you to the guys, Liam and James, who are just always there when I need them. And I'm really, really looking forward to this fall and the lead up to The Rise of Skywalker and how this is all going to resolve. And I have a lot to get done in the meantime. So I hope everyone has a nice summer. And uh, two weeks without my voice, but we'll be back very soon. Thank you for listening to What the Force. I'm Marie Claire Gould, your host. Our music is the What the Force theme, orchestral music by Christy Carew for What the Force. We have a Patreon at patreon.com slash whattheforce. We would like to thank all of our patrons, especially those who love What the Force, Night Huntress in Wild Space, Susan and Kathy. We are available on iTunes, Google Play, and all other podcatchers, including YouTube. You can connect to us on Twitter at WT4Show, on Facebook at What the Force, and on Instagram at WT Force Podcast. Feel free to reach out to us and start a conversation. Cheers. <laughs>